Hello? Hey, we got a message from somebody at this number. Um, yeah. I'm told you have access to a certain celebrity's private information. Is that right? Yeah, but I'm not sure I'm doing yeah, okay, this. Okay, hold on. Take it easy. If you have what you say you have, we're talking about something in the $80,000 range. It's this computer, right? Okay. Okay, what's on it? Emails, photos? Yeah, I know you had a journal in there. A so. journal? Okay. Who's this going to happen next? We're going to send you an electronic check. Wait, 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 wait. No, I'm not sure I'm doing this yet. I need to think about it. Well, I'd think fast if I were you. Okay. The movie doesn't open so well, it might be worth shit. Yo, Jacob! Text me this number when you make up your mind. Well, hi, everybody. This is Mark Chaffordini. Thanks for coming back to the Ghost Seat Talk podcast. We are super thrilled, delighted, um, hardly able to contain the excitement because we have two fantastic guests on the show. Natalie Metzger and Alden Ehrenreich, our producer-actor combo, producer-director combo. They, there's so many hats and so many titles that these two have. We are thrilled to have them both on the show. Uh, before we kick it off into you know, next gear, next level. How's things in your world, guys? Things are great. Uh, the strike is over and we have, um, at Vanishing Angle, we have two features that we're gearing up to shoot um, right at the top of the year. So we're, uh, things are chugging along and we have um, Shadow Brother Sunday doing the festivals, which has been really great to see. Yeah, it feels like it's like when it's like the city got its braces off or something. It's that kind of excited energy. Um, and uh, so that feels really good to have in the air. There's so many people who have had such a hard time, uh, you know, trying to make ends meet during this time. There are people who had to give up their dream of being in Hollywood or being storytellers. There are, you know, ancillary businesses like restaurants that have shut down. Um, so it's a wonderful feeling for the, to be able to turn the page on that. And then I'm, excited to you know do continue to do this uh with shadow brothers sunday and the the festivals i've got a movie i'm going to act in uh that i'm preparing for and um and i have a theater space on the east side of la that we're putting together to do our first play in in uh, march i remember getting my braces off and you know for a year and a half like you're able to feel a micro millimeter and then yeah your, your teeth just feel so huge after they're off because it's like now right. it's like unlimited possibilities sink your teeth into things literally i'm super yes, excited I, and happy for you guys yes you too you too you know it's so funny thinking about the, your uh, career trajectory you were born in the year of both the last crusade and batman 89 so i think that cosmic cinema you know stuff going through the air probably found its way into you know your your neck of the woods uh but right. also i mean you've Discovered by Spielberg, your two-time Coppola veteran, Howard, the Coen brothers, Nolan. At what point did you like, I think I could do better. Let me, let me try my <laughs> hand correctly. That's funny. That's not quite the, uh, the, the way I framed it in my mind. But, um, but you, you know, getting to work with those people has been the greatest creative and the greatest experience of my creative and professional life. I mean, just the most and I thrilling. And I, I feel like I was able to get this access to this incredible film school and learn from these masters up close and personal. And in some cases, really explicitly kind of sit these people down and ask them questions and get their insights into filmmaking. Um, and that had always been with me. Uh, as something I wanted to do and acting happened to take off uh, faster as it, it typically does. Um, and so, you know, I just, yeah, feel enormously lucky to be able to have worked with those people. Uh, yeah, it must be an embarrassment of riches. But I think the, the next thing for both of you is, you know, as a consumer, as somebody who runs a uh, a film blog, you know, there's a perception that, you know, these people have greatness in them. They're great people. So do you have interactions with people who you think are great people, but at the end of the day, they're just like people who do great stuff? Like, how, how does those interactions in uh, meeting your heroes work? It's really different for me on a case-to-case -case basis, but um, I think they all are 
people. And I think that the work that they make comes out of a particular side of them that's touched with something and, and inspired by something that's sort of bigger than their personality or bigger than their selves in the small s sense. It feels like they're people who are really dedicated, who work really hard, who are, have all the foibles and insecurities and all these things that everybody else has. You know, Coppola in particular has been really honest and frank about how much just anxiety and doubt was his entire career he was just filled with. And so, um, yeah, you kind of do the best you work as hard as you can and you show up and you, you pray that, that it's going to rain basically. Well, Natalie, you have an eye for talent. Uh, can you, what was your and Alden's meet cue for vanishing angle and, uh, the Ehrenreich family? Um, we got connected through a mutual friend. Um, and, uh, you know, Alden was looking for a, for a producer for shadow brother Sunday. And, um, we met and just kind of talked about what his his vision was, which I was really impressed by. And um, I mean, really, it was reading the script that uh, completely sold me on the film. It, it's it's such a beautiful and complex story, and made me sob afterwards. Um, Alden's able to find this like these fascinating like uh uh angles into these different characters who you know at first glance you might have certain assumptions about them but by the end of the film you might have others and upon different viewings you might feel differently um and so uh yeah there's so much texture and nuance and and humanity in um the characters that he's written and uh, yeah, I was just really impressed and uh, was really excited when he told me that he wanted to shoot on film, when he that he wanted to um, do like really involved rehearsals to really make the family feel authentically like a family. Um, and just his his overall approach, which was to really um, make the storyline and the characters feel feel real. And uh, I think he achieved that. And it was really fun to watch um, him do that. Well, talk to me about the script specifically. Um, film is about 15 minutes. You know, rough math is a minute per page. But uh, how much was written? How much was uh, inferred? How much did you make up on the day? You know, how, how did how did you get from winning over Vanishing Angle to now me raving about it? No, oh, thanks. Um, uh, the original draft was a lot longer. I think it was like 28 pages or something. And there was um, a lot more uh, dialogue. That's probably where the most uh, time got cut out of the film. But I'd also written uh, different transitions. So, so yeah, so the there was some improvisation. What we did is a lot of improvisation in the rehearsal process. So we had a four day rehearsal process that was super important to me because I wanted, especially in a short film, it's really common for you to just not totally believe the performances or the world of it because it's that you're working on such a more limited budget and all these things. So I really wanted the film to, when you see it, feel like you're walking into a world that's been, you know, that you believe that has that level of detail, that richness of idiosyncrasy, that these people really have a dynamic with each other. You know, you relate to people, your body, your gestures, your mannerisms are really different based on your familiarity with the people you're around. And you can't entirely fake that. So building that, we did family meals and arguments and me and nick robinson did improvisations where we were he was 13 and i'm 16 and i'm showing him my music and talking about my dreams and he's looking up to me and then we went out in the yard and played catch you know and he wrote me letters from camp and all this kind of stuff um because you know when you see when you meet these characters my character cole has really fallen on hard times and has failed and Jacobs had this ascendancy to stardom. And so having that background just really informed all the dynamics. Um, and then we shot it pretty close to what the script ended up being as a result of those processes. Um, and then the editing process was just a whittling away of finding that you kind of say what you wanted to say more 
poignantly with less sometimes, um, particularly dialogue, because I have a real love for theater. So it was kind of a learning process for me, that balance. Um, but yeah. Okay. Well, you mentioned editing. You uh, you can credit the success of this to a pair of editors. How did they yes. share responsibilities? How did they inform the cut? And how did yeah. you work with them? Great question. So Joe Peeler is someone I'd worked with in the past. He's an old friend of mine. I'd worked with him forever. And we were worked really closely. I was shooting a Marvel series in Atlanta and he flew out and lived with me in the house. And we had this kind of uh, what we were calling our old Hollywood editing summit, where we would like go out and have dinner and then go and edit all day. Um, and, and so we kind of worked on, you know, we made the selects for the most part together um, and shaped a, most of the film, but the film I think was 28 minutes long or something. And then what happened was Joe, directed a documentary called bad press that got into Sundance and had to basically leave the project because he had to do all this Sundance stuff. And, uh, I didn't feel that we were done with the film. And so Natalie had worked with David Hines and David came in and, uh, it was a great thing because Joe had been with me since Joe and I came up with the flashback together. The original script did not have that. Joe was so Joe created the animatic kind of the animated. We did this crude animated version of the film. He was so involved in the version of it as written. And David was able to come in with this new objectivity and see what the movie was and what we had with no awareness of what my original intentions were or what was in the script or anything like that. And just go boom, 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 and see it the way that people would see it with fresh eyes. And so his contribution kind of lit this new fuse on the film and and took it to kind of took what Joe and I were intending and and brought it made brought that message to fuller effect for better impact. I I love that because the thing you're always concerned or cautious about is like you have decisions made to certain point in time and anybody who comes whether they override or undercut yes. or there's you know do they co are they cohesive so in the end i think this is all all great i i it kind of made me want to do this every time because it has <laughs> nothing to do with the editor being great the greatest editor walter merch in the world at some point might lose that kind of objectivity and it's really wonderful to have somebody come in and and kind of do another pass at it so it, i just i just loved it yeah Great. Well, you know, I know it takes a, a village to raise a child. It's got to take, you know, a city or a, a mega city to, to make anything happen on film. So, Natalie, when when the ask is all in says, I want this for craft services or I want this, like, how do you temper each other's expectations? I love the behind the scenes photos. It seems like you're always there at the same time. So how did you how did you support this cause? Well, I, I will say Alden, I don't, I don't think made a single request for, for crafty. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's so laid back and, and, and calm. Um, but uh, no, I think, I think like, like, like the biggest, the biggest ask and the biggest um, kind of hurdle to cross was um, shooting on film. Like, first of all, we were shooting at a time when um, all the vendors were out of film stock. So we were struggling just to find vendors that had film stock that had enough for what we wanted to shoot um, because we wanted to get a lot of coverage um, and also trying to make that, you know, you know, all, all work within the budget. So, so that was, I think, one of the, the, the most complicated things to pull off, but I think, you know, how, how it turned out really, really shows how, how worth it it was. Um, we had one day where the camera kept jamming and it was the day that we were shooting the Cole and Jacob scene like the most important scene of the entire film um and the one that you know like really needed breathing room for the performances and all that stuff so that was um complicated but we were able to get a tech um to actually come out to um surface the camera like while we were on on set and because it kept jamming we had to get extra film stock and so we found an amazing vendor that actually delivered film stock to our location and so it was uh <laughs> everyone like really kind of like jumped on board to to help make it happen well that that's fantastic i mean I, I love that sort of on the day the energy that's there and i think that energy whether in you know in, on purpose or not definitely added to the anxiety of the film i i've watched this i'm, I'm ashamed to say six times but i 
it's because there's certain things that, like you say, you interpret a character's portrayal or a line differently. I think I'd like to highlight two specific points, maybe get your mentality. Um, when Jacob sees his brother on TV, or I'm sorry, when, when Cole sees his brother on TV and yeah. he talks about the crew that he's with surviving the, the heat and they become a family, you have this look where you're kind of frozen. And as soon as he says the word family, you just... I mean, it's like an iceberg crumbling, but you only move your body like a fraction of an inch. So how how do you dive into like, how do you get that granular? Um, I think, you know, the, I mean, that, it, it go, that goes, that in particular goes back to acting. And this, that moment in particular was kind of a reverse engineered moment because, um, uh, you know, so, so as far as having expressing, you know, the whole job is to try to be in it as much as you possibly can and feel it as much as you can. Um, and that moment to me is really about, um, when you are envious of someone in some way, it doesn't even have to be a career. It could be a friend who hasn't called you back in a while or, and, or it could be, uh, you know, uh, someone that's rejected you romantically or anything. And you see them sort of being, uh, voluble or voluble. I don't think that's the right word, but being, being, being fun and having fun in a setting that kind of resentment you feel when you see them being expansive and having fun and other people liking them. And you kind of go, yeah, but they, yeah, everybody loves this person, but they didn't call me back or they, whatever. And, uh, and so it's, it, it's that moment, but in that moment in particular, we had control over what we had Jacob saying, and it was a late edit discovery that we could have, you know, I had Nick do all these phony, uh, uh, interviews at the end of the, it was the last thing we shot he did all these talks these 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 junket interviews basically and i was like it can't really be this generic like when i first wrote this stuff i was like i need to make sure it's real and then i looked at all of them and i was like no this is exactly the same kind of vacuous bullshit that we are all saying on these junket uh, especially those type of interviews so um so we had all this great stuff of him doing it. And, and, and one of them was, we really became a family. I think it was an ADR line. And when we found that he could say that, that, that this other group of people had become like a family to him. And we don't know the details yet when we have that moment, but Cole's reaction to that. And, and um, it, it, it kind of planted a, 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 a small flag at the beginning of the film about what this is about thematically that we found really that ended up paying a lot of dividends but it was an unplanned thing actually okay well this wasn't going to be my next question but was getting hit in the face with a blow up balloon bat was that planned or unplanned that was very planned that was okay. a part of it from the original thing and 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 you know like everything you don't know how that's gonna go and that was one that really worked out well, you know, you have to blow up the bat to a certain level of fullness. So it's hard enough to hit you hard enough in the uh -huh. face and sound effects and the kid getting, you know, really into it and going to town. So that was good. We did. We like definitely did like practice stuff where where the uh, the, the child actor just got to like really practice hitting Alden hard. And I think I think on the day uh Alden felt like he wasn't getting hit hard enough and so I think we had right. someone else hitting <laughs> I think the first AD was just standing right behind the camera and just smacking <laughs> the face over and over and over again well my my true follow-up question is when you are having um a talk with your brother in the room and you're about to ask for the money um yeah. it looks like you you were holding your breath how did you how did you get your blood your face flushed everything was like you look like you're on the verge of a breakdown just asking this you know, of your brother. Um, I think again, you know, like that's, um, uh, that's what you aspire to. I'm really glad that that, uh, landed for you because that's what you aspire to is there's a famous acting story. It called Deuce's blush. And there's Eleanor Duza was a, was a, um, theater actress and I think like the 1900s early 1900s rather um and uh 
it's Sanford Meisner, this great acting coach, talking about a blo- about being in the audience and seeing her do something that genuinely made her blush, which is a you know physiological reaction to something that we really can't choose to do. And it's used as this metaphor of putting yourself so thoroughly into the circumstances that the character is in that you will have these reactions. And it's a great sort of um, symbol, symbolic, you know, great metaphor for what you're aspiring to. So, um, you know, yeah, it was building who this character was and how he, what he meant to me. It, a real surprise was just because I wrote it did not mean I knew what, how to prepare it as an actor, you know, anymore, you know, you, you, you know, certain things you wouldn't, if you didn't write it, but you actually have to treat it like something you didn't write. And I actually found that I had to play it slightly different than I had written it for me to be able to invest in it emotionally. So um, all of those things were really interesting. And then, and then you get, you know, I loved acting and directing at the same time so much because you can take risks you know you know that you have the final say you don't you, you feel a kind of a, a freedom to to do things that might end up being bad that when someone else is going to edit it you just on some subliminal level don't necessarily give yourself even though you probably should um so i just adored that process and then acting and directing this particular piece where I'm rushed and hurried and, you know, we shot four days and I'm doing all this stuff. It all complemented the tension and the stress and the anxiety and the challenge of it is it becomes fuel and becomes, you know, grist for the mill. Well, I I can only imagine the, the ownership that you're taking. I mean, this came from you, you're watching it manifest, you're using people and resources and professionals, but, um, but sometimes you get tunnel vision. And so um, I'm, I'm, you know, maybe Natalie's a good question for you. How do you able, how are you able to maybe forecast or look ahead and just help clear the road without being a helicopter parent, so to speak? Um, I mean, I, I think I, I work with a lot of um, writer, director, actors, and I think, um, you know, so like, first of all, they're, they're all so incredible, but like Alden was really amazing to watch and 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 you're flagging some of these like really amazing performance mo- moments um but like the behind the scenes of that is Alden's running around like walking everyone through where, where camera's gonna be you know giving feedback on a costume doing all this stuff and then stepping right into frame calling action and then immediately like getting super emotional and like you know teary-eyed and watching that process and how condensed that all happened in terms of time was so amazing and I think <laughs> deserve, deserves an award in and of itself um but yeah you know I think you know when when um when a director is is in the scene you know it's it's uh you know really creating that that team um you know that core creative team that can be that that sounding board um to make sure that we have it and so that's you know from everyone from the dp and the first ad to me and some of the other team members um and i think everyone was just so passionate and excited about this story that um everyone was 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 willing to like go the the extra mile to to make sure that we really got it um and uh you know we would all kind of check in with each other uh, after, uh, we did like a series of takes and be like, cool, did we get it? Do we want to try it this way? And, um, um, and Alton was also so, so responsive and like knew exactly, like, I think we need to do it this way again. And (laughs) so he, he could feel it inside of it. And then, you know, we were all there on, on the outside to give, um, any extra feedback. Yeah. Well, and what I would add to that too, is because I was so inside of it, you know, as the actor and all of these things, I wanted to be as prepared as possible. And so it was so valuable to have Natalie from Natalie did such an unbelievable job putting this together, gathering the people, introducing me to the right people who would be good for it, being a sounding board for years. I mean, we started prepping this in in 2020 and shot it last year. So along every step of the way. And so we did, you know, a table read where we, I wanted to stress test the movie as much as I could so that we weren't doing it that on the day. And I was really inspired by the Pixar process of how much they kind of prepare in advance. So we did a table read with all these actors. We recorded it. Then I drew these story and we had Natalie and a group of people, kind of my friends and brain trust and people from vanishing angle there. And then we talked about the, the reading 
then we took the recording of that and put it under these these storyboards that I drew and animated it. And we screened that animatic of the film of the whole movie. You're seeing it visually for another group of people at my theater space and then sat out in the back. And then we did the same thing when it came time to cuts, but yeah, on set, Natalie and the first AD and the cinematographer really become this de facto brain trust where you're feeling these things out in real time. And I would, could not have done this without leaning on especially Natalie and everybody for every decision, hiring decision, you know, who's, how are we dealing with the logistical side of it? Where are we shooting all this kind of stuff? I was a judge for the uh, Atlanta Sci-Fi uh, Short Film Festival or uh, Atlanta Sci-Fi Film Festival that had a focus on short films. And, and it reminded me that vehicles, uh, that shorts can be vehicles for a number of different things. It could be a pilot for a TV show. It could be a proof of concept. It could be like a whole narrative condensed. Did you both yeah. have the same like vision for this, you know, from, from start to finish, you know, is this a snapshot of a person's life? Is this a TV episode? You know, what, what, ex expand on the story. Yeah. You know, I, I wrote it really as its own piece. Uh, I wanted to make a short film for two reasons. One is because I wanted to learn more as a filmmaker before I made the first feature and two, because I wanted the people that I end up working with on the first feature to, because I've always felt this as an actor, when I've seen a piece of work that a filmmaker has made, even if I would sign on without having seen that, if I have seen something that was good, it gives me a lot more faith and confidence in them over the course of three months when things are inevitably going to go wrong, knowing that they've made something that worked instills a lot more faith. So that was why I wanted to do it. And then Natalie and I met. The, we were going to go in 2020 and the pandemic happened and we were talking about, well, maybe in a couple months and it ended up being two years. And over the span of that time, it would have been way easier to make this a feature uh, because people are much more willing to be a part of it from the financiers to the actors, et cetera. And so, especially given this was a big budget fee, uh, short, all these things. Um, and we really tried i mean i really tried and natalie was really supportive in my effort to explore what this would be as an anthology of short stories about this one family like this is the cole story and then there's a bob story and there's a jacob story i wrote versions of it it didn't want to be that i we tried to do it as an anthology movie with other filmmakers doing other shorts uh you know around the theme of failure or even Bible stories, because this is kind of a Cain and Abel piece. And what would that look like? And it just never wanted to be anything other than this short story that stands intact. So uh, I want to, I feel that it's a film, you know, it's a 15 minute film, but now these sort of duration things, they're not really meaningful because of the streaming world and the way we all consume stuff. So Ugh, I don't like saying consume or content, but anyway, the way we watch things, the way we take things in. Um, but uh, so I want to release this as a film, you know, once we're through the festival circuit, circuit and can figure out where to put this, uh, I want to put it out and do press like we're doing now and all this stuff. And then the feature that I'm writing is uh, an entirely different story with different characters that wants, that has its own kind of, size to it that I feel more comfortable and confident tackling now that I've taken on, you know, a film that really was more like a micro budget feature in terms of its production challenges, you know, other than the amount of days. I can only imagine how stress is upon each of you in four days, but uh, I'm, I'm tremendously honored to speak to you about this. And I, you know, I'm, I'm a big film score fan. And I was thinking to myself, this reminds me of something else I've seen, and I didn't put it together until I saw Brian McGomber. Um, Brian McGomber did the music to Cretia, Trey Edward Schultz's Cretia. Similar, yeah. disastrous family thing, and I'm just wondering, how were some of the discussions with him, the percussion and the, the, the droning that he used, how did he help enhance this narrative? So he, yeah, he... Uh... He was someone I felt really passionate about being a part of this. He was basically my top pick from the outset. Um, he had done the score for Fair Play, which is the movie that I was in recently. And he uh, did a great job with that. 
Um, and I was a huge Krisha fan that along with, uh, Rachel getting married and punch drunk love were probably like the biggest touch points for this movie. Um, and so he works in a really interesting way. Like he likes to draw, uh, what the music would sound like. It's very challenging to talk about music and music was actually the only piece of the whole film. I really didn't have a clear sense of when we were shooting, people would ask me, what should the music be in? Now what I would do is give the script to a composer the in pre-production, I think, and get start getting ideas going. But um we would watch the movie and what we ended up I I, I think what was useful for me, I still feel like I'm very much learning this side of it because it's very new to me. But what was really useful is to have some kind of theory, some kind of concept basically for the music. And in this, it was sort of two and a half things. It was Number one is a, a a drum beat that is that is a kind of a war drum intensity and pressure of what Cole the 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 ominousness of what Cole is looking at this kind of imagine Macbeth walking down a hallway knowing he's going to kill Duncan or whatever I think Duncan and 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 that kind of tension and 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 that that's staying with him. And then something that could live on top of it that's more like a squeeble or a, something lighter that almost is like the shades of doubt or the other voices coming in or the also kind of the comedy of it. And that there's these and something a little more soft and that it's two things warring with each other inside Cole. So this low thing and then this higher frequency thing that's on top of it and trying to find that tonally so that it's expressing itself in all of these things and then there's a couple moments like when he opens the door and sees the computer for the first time there's a piano note or i think when jacob comes in the house there's a piano note and those uh when when bob leaves the room after the fight there's this piano note and those piano notes are um foreshadowing they to when he reads the letter at the end and the entire environment of the movie and his entire emotional state changes, those little uh, breadcrumbs of piano notes grow and expand into the score that underlies the, the letter. And it's this tenderness and love that he has for his brother that he's been blocking out in the intensity of what he's, you know, undecided about doing. And so that's that was kind of the theory and then you talk and then someone writes something and then you go, oh, we were talking about the same thing, but the, how we hear it is different. And then we continue to do a bunch of different iterations and and landed on something that I just and and then another he just added a couple things into the family photo scene that were phenomenal. The piano thing at the end, we worked on a lot, a lot of different versions of it and what we landed on. I'm just so thrilled with. And then uh, Sean Renner is someone who works with him and did some music editing that was really helpful, too. So, um, yeah, it was a really, really interesting process. Uh, that that's awesome because I um you know I I got to speak with um Brian after he scored Creature and he was telling me that when Trey wrote it they intended to do a feature film and then they had to turn it into a short because they couldn't do it and right. he was saying something about you know if he re really needed to react to what he saw on screen because if he had written what was on the script it it would have you know you, you would have eventually gotten what you got eventually but you probably would have right. wasted time getting there so. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, either, either way, I'm I'm just in love with the process. It's like hearts everywhere. So, <laughs> Natalie, I I think Alden's doing all right. Who uh, who was the brain trust who had to get him an acting coach? <laughs> and, and who's Jesse? <laughs> oh, that's on the thing. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> so Jesse Alice. Well, now you want to speak to this, or I can. Oh, right, you go. <laughs> Je Jesse Alice is uh is my acting coach he's also one of my oldest friends he's a really great actor in his own right and um you know tiger woods has a golf coach it's like there's especially when you're in this it's really really valuable um to have that outside point of view to talk things through to get insights as soon as you say yes and you know that you're the one doing it you lose a lot of objectivity and so i work with him on everything he's really fantastic <laughs> and, um, you know, I think about this story when they did There Will Be Blood, there's this uh, Daniel Day-Lewis and Paul Thomas Anderson talked about the first few weeks, I think the first two weeks, he was doing something and it wasn't 
quite right. And after the first two weeks, Paul Tom Sanderson came in and said, this isn't quite right. We need to do it a different way. And, um, and so probably, you know, one of, if not the greatest actor in the world, you know, Meryl Streep and him. Um, and so having, knowing that at that level of mastery, you still need an outside set of eyes to kind of tell you quite where it wants to be is, was very, um, heartening. And, um, and so I work with him on everything. And in this project in particular, he really pushed me to certain things and knows me so well that, um, that, that, that unlocked some stuff. So I love it. And I think anyone, especially if you're directing yourself, but anyone who's acting in anything, it's sort of hubris to just think you can do it. Sometimes you can, but you're setting your, you're giving yourself an incredible disadvantage. If you, I don't believe in the idea that someone grows out of needing that basically. I need to plug my computer in so it doesn't die. No problem. Well, Natalie, how, how's River doing? Ah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I think I think he just went went down for for a nap. If I heard stuff in the in the other room. <laughs> do you have kids? I do. I have an eight month old named Chelsea and an eight year old named Olivia. And so. Um, I've had to, my wife and I have had a slightly stressful week. They both got sick and had to stay home. So we're kind of um, yeah. playing zone defense to try to figure out who gets what and still get work done. Because uh, unfortunately, banks don't take little kids' smiles or laughter. So we have to <laughs> perform and hit our deadlines. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, Alden, um, you said uh, the hardest part about acting is when you when you're not employed. So uh, now that you've gotten to the I director did? stage, yeah, this goes back to a a DP thirty That's interview. Hard. Hail Caesar! Yeah. Right. So now that you're in the directing world, and Natalie, what I guess, what is the toughest part about a producer, and what is the toughest part about being a director now? Um, uh, the the toughest part about being a producer is um. You know, I think it always comes down to financing because, you know, once you have the financing in place and actually making the thing, there's obviously things that come up, challenges, fires, you know, that, that you're dealing with. But it's just such a joy because you're getting to make movies with some of the people that you respect and love the most. And um, that process is so amazing. And I think it's such a collaborative medium that seeing all these different people come together to make this thing together is, I don't know, it's, it's, it's still pretty magical in my mind. Like when, when we like still, when I, when I first see a film that I've produced, like screen with an audience, like I, I, I get chills. It's just so, it's so cool. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the hardest part is like getting to make the thing and that's, and that's always, um, raising the financing and that's, um, you know, no matter if it's a $40 million movie or a $300,000 movie, um, or a short, it's, it's, um, it's always, you know, a, a, a process, but, um, and that I don't think will ever change, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I think for me, what I feel right now is like, you know, there's so many different challenges that present themselves when you're making the whole thing. is just problem solving basically, but I don't feel any kind of like feeling of challenge around those things. Cause they're so pleasurable. They're so enjoyable. I think the biggest challenge for me is like, I would, I would go direct a movie tomorrow if I had a piece of material that was of the quality depth and personal resonance to me that I need it to be. Cause I don't think I would do a very good job as a director. I wouldn't be interested in doing a good job as a director if I wasn't deeply connected to the material, not only what it's about, but also a sort of level of craftsmanship that I, that I want in something. And so the hardest part for me right now, I'm writing the feature. I've been writing the feature for two years. I mean, I've been acting a lot, so it keeps getting put somewhat on hold, but if I, I can't uh, finding that balance because I'm, I, I'm my, the director in me is mad at the writer in me for not being done because I really want to go through. The film. So finding writers who either have scripts or finding writers to collaborate with on ideas or um, which I'm doing some of right now 
finding also finding a way of working with writers in a similar sense that I work with actors when I'm directing, which is not just to have them do their job, but to kind of set a tone or ask of them something more personal or deep that can bring out a piece of a, a kind of perf a, a writing performance that feels that way is something I wish I was really, you know, locked into now and could figure out. And I'm trying to go talk to um, people I've worked with as filmmakers and ask them about their process with that. The Ron Howards and Steven Spielbergs of the world who aren't writing their own material in that way. So um, uh, that's the hardest part for me right now. Cause if I had six scripts that I loved, honestly, even saying that the idea of that like fills me with such joy. And I, it like, I, it's, I just, it hurts so much that that feels like such a huge task, but it is because writing takes so long. It's such a, intricate involved personal process to make something really good you know you can dash off a piece of shit pretty easily but it's to do that it's a different thing so um that's my that's my kind of hungry urgent feeling right now is to find a way to to do that while finding enough time while I'm prepping this film to write you know as at the same time my own you know the the what will be hopefully the feature well you know to quote one of the greatest lines in cinema would that it were so simple. Um, well, I'll I'll give you a script, and then then actually down to five. So I think hey, uh, that, that should take some weight off your shoulders. Perfect. Um, I um, since we're opening this up to bigger things than just uh, Shadow Brother Sunday, um, and just quickly touching on something that uh, Matt Damon said about Steven Spielberg. Uh, I don't know if you, th this is still in people's vernacular, but there's a part in like the special features of Saving Private Ryan where Matt Damon gets this great idea. I'm going to be a director one day. So he shadows Steven Spielberg and Steven's yeah. like takes a golf cart over here and then goes over to here and talks to editing. And it's like, and at the end of it, Matt Damon was like, I, I, I can't do that. I can't. <laughs> so I just, I, I think of myself in, you know, like, again, I'm a consumer and I'm, this is all perception. I can control my body. The idea of controlling another body is, you know, doubly. So if you think of something like the deer hunter, Michael Camino dealing with crowds or the guys coming out of the steel mill, like how you even like, how, do, how did you do that? How did, how does how Steven Spielberg get an army of people acting John Ford, all same thing. So it's like, I just, yeah. these aren't questions that anyone in particular, I'm just well, geeking out. I mean, Natalie, I'm sure has a lot to say about this too. I feel it, what it makes me think of is, you know, I've had I have more lasting relationships with filmmakers I've worked for than actors. And I think it's because in order to be a filmmaker, you have to be two things. You have to be an artist and you have to be a leader. And to be a leader requires a kind of uh, discipline and maturity that being an artist doesn't necessarily. You can be a rock star and be a total fucking mess. You can be an actor and be a total mess. But to be a filmmaker, you have to be balancing this, this sort of <clears throat> heart of a poet with a somewhat militaristic sense of structure, leadership, inspiring other people, you know, and, and great leadership in and of itself is such a beautiful art form to see somebody like working for Chris Nolan and seeing the way that he uh, you know, leads a group of people and what the set feels like and how the people working for him sort of uh, feel and the amount of focus they have. It's its own craft and art form that I have as much passion for about as I do filmmaking and learning the, the art of. Natalie, you, I mean, you, you are also a leader in that sense and you're galvanizing people and getting people to work for low amount and getting, making miracles happen and doing all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think uh, so there's like the like the leader aspect and the and the artistic aspect, but I also think that there is there's a charisma needed to directing because you're like convincing everyone that this vision of yours is like the is like the thing to trust and to go with. And um and there are days that are, you know, complicated or long and you you kind of have to like like seduce everyone in a way that like this is 
this is going to be fun. We're going to do this together. Um, and so like, you know, like thinking about the, the directors that I really love working with, they, they also on top of having just such a strong artistic vision, um, and, and, and being a good leader, there's just this like charisma that they have this like magnetism that they have as people that, um, that everyone around them has this kind of trust of, I, you know, I trust you, like, let's, like, let's do this. And I think that that's not only in artistic vision, but I think that's also just in general, like humanity, like there's like a level of respect and trust that, that is, that is mutual from, you know, like from a director, like, like some of the best directors I know, and this is Alden included, um, have so much graciousness and, um, show so much gratitude to like the team around them um where there's 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 no ego it's it's very it's very much um uh this like collaborative like team effort and it makes everyone just go that much further and work that much harder and um and i think it's it's really cool to see and i think people really want to work with those people more often as well because they feel like they're treated as human beings when they you know go on to set which is you know, surprisingly rare sometimes in, in this industry. Well, I have, um, I had an old boss who it, it wasn't exactly paraphrased, but it's like, it's mentality. I, I want the best for you so I can get the best from you. And I think that that getting to uh, a level of connection, respect, so that it's, it's less dictatorial. It's almost like, um, instead of teaching somebody, you let, like, you let them learn. It's a weird sort of, uh, Splitting hairs, really. Yeah, yeah there's there, there's a kind of a generosity that has to ha has to be there because you you know like when you're just an actor, you're on some level just constantly getting people to pay attention to you and trying to make people think a certain way about you or whatever it is. And when you're a filmmaker, like <clears throat> if you're going to get people to do well, you have to pay a lot of attention to who they are and what they're actually passionate about and what gets the best out of them. And it becomes a very other directed thing. You're really not nearly as focused on yourself. Um, and it puts you, I think, in a mentality that's a better self than, you know, it's than even just daily life, you know, as much as we end up focusing on ourselves a lot. You know, there's, there's something to be said about the support group, uh, the people who are your advocates. A lot of times it's family Alden, uh, how, how's your Nana doing? And has she gotten any better keeping secrets? That's very funny. Um, she uh, she passed away, unfortunately, um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thanks, yeah. But um, she's with me all the time and uh, made a huge impact on my life. Well, I also like seeing that you credited uh, thanks to your mom at the end of the, the short, so. Oh, um, yeah. Oh yeah. My mom was, um, uh, very helpful with my mom's interior designer and, um, and also a writer. And so like my mom is a huge source of artistic. My mom really has a big impact on the origins of me wanting to be an artist. She's a great lover of art as was my Nana. And so she was, and, and it's just so helpful. And so she was, you know, the production designer came over to the house and basically had her pick of whatever we had to offer here from my mom's house and uh, called all her friends when we were looking for the right house to film the movie in, which was a huge undertaking trying to find the, the right house for the movie because, you, you know, the house is such an integral part of the story. Um, uh, so, yeah, she was great. Okay. Well, Thanksgiving is coming up. I think we can all give thanks to the people who who got us here. And and Natalie luckily gets to work with uh, her husband and partner. And so uh, probably going to give River a PA position at some point, right? Fitting him up for a jacket, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm um I'm I, I'm already throwing it out to my friends. I'm like I'm like feel free to write a baby into your script because right. you can use them. Like I'm I'm already offering right. you know, child labor, but <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, we're 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 like we're already talking about how how early we can make him an intern and. <laughs> okay. He's either gonna be 
like the kid the most into cinema of anyone ever or like want nothing to do with that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly some some <laughs> a, a friend of ours just gave him um a collection of of baby books from the academy Mu museum and it's uh they're wow. an intro uh it's like the cinephile baby series and oh so there's a book on film noir there's a book on giallo horror there's um a book wow. on uh french new wave and so <laughs> i'm like oh wow he's getting like deep deep dive <laughs> filmmaking education you know, speaking of my mom actually something that she did when i was a little kid is we had like these books like that we had this series called lives of the artist and it was all these like different paint it was like a kid's book about van gogh and a kid's book about picasso and a kid's book about cezanne and like all these illustrated classics. And I thought like I'd read Moby Dick and all these books when I was older, which I had and I'd read like the kids version, but that was kind of my first conception of what being an artist is. And, and, and my parents showed me all these old movies and silent movies and stuff. And it's like, it's so great to just inundate a child with the biggest, you know, forget children's stuff. It's like the biggest, most beautiful, achievements of human beings have been able to do whether it's in the arts or science or anything and it's like it really sets the watermark at this early age um that doesn't quite work that way if you just learn about it way later you know so i'm very grateful to her for that <laughs> well uh before we head out i have uh two things i want to say the end of shadow brother sunday i was reminded of the ending of sorcerer and I'm wondering, you never seen I, that? Okay. It's like, it's literally, I could show you my movies I want to watch list. And it's like <laughs> probably in the top five because I've always wanted to see it. And Joe Peeler loves Sorcerer, um, but I've never seen it. I got to see it now. Okay. Come to Dallas. We could watch it together. It'd be a lot of fun. Oh, um, you're in Dallas? Yes. Nice. I like the black room. I like when people aren't afraid of a darker colored wall. Well, this was a wedding present to my wife. We bought the house, then got married the next year, and um, short of going to Bora Bora, which was, <laughs> that ain't going to happen, uh, I decided to up and down the ladder after every night after work for a week, and it just, it works for uh, for our media room. So yeah, well, great. thank you, Alden. Thank you, Alden. Um, I, I should throw it right back to your mom. That's a wonderful sure. blush <laughs> terracotta color. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, <laughs> there I'm back. Um, the other thing I was going to say is um, regarding experiences. I think uh, you know, cinema does different things for uh, everybody. We all have you know times we've been wowed and floored. I mean, I loved uh, Life of Pi. Um, I was blown away by Parasite. Um, but as a consumer, like we're seeing the put together package. So a lot of times they say, you know, don't you know, you don't want to meet the wizard behind the curtain so whether it is hail caesar where you got to kind of experience the decadence of hollywood sets or solo which i believe that was the first film to use the volume screen um which that was pretty cool watermark in your career what do you prefer what's better do are they equal for different reasons what's your what's your take you mean in terms of genres and stuff like what's the Ah uh, no no uh, get, getting to use that kind of technology and set design to help inform your character and, and oh act. I see I see um I think the more real something is the better which is kind of well it's certainly the rationale behind uh uh you know on the Cohen set there's you know we're just they built everything but also Christopher Nolan is really the purest of that I mean the they like made a bomb you know for Oppenheimer um, and he there's no CGI which is shocking and I think that ethos is pretty inspiring um, because these things age but it's still kind of the same idea behind the I forgot it was called the volume screen that's the wraparound right that we did yeah. so the thing with that is like I'd done green screen and we still did a little of that, but to have the real thing, it's kind of the same rationale. You have the real thing lighting you. Bradford, the DP loved that. You have something the actors are really looking at and it was super effective and also gave people an amount of control that just made everything 
you know, much less of a headache. So I think the more real something is, the better. I'm very um, suspicious about um, uh, using too much digital stuff because I just think it ends up looking bad. Like, you know, like our eyes change and our sophistication as audiences change. And if you go watch Titanic, which was the, you know, greatest achievement in digital filmmaking at that moment, it looks like a video game to us now, probably. So how is that not going to be the case in 20 years with something that's getting made, even with it's, you know, this, and I, and I just tend to think the same way about that, that we will, we, we get more sophisticated as well. It's not just the technology getting more sophisticated. Our eyes do, but real never isn't real. And so you're kind of betting on um, its shelf life being a lot longer, if not infinite when you do stuff like that. Okay, that's fair. Well, I, you know, at the end of the day, people most of the time gravitate toward what an actor is doing. Like I was saying, I, I focused on your your eye drop or a little bit of a you know a facial gesture. I remember watching, um, it was it was an inside the actor studio like video with Kevin Costner where he was detailing. Uh, he was doing I might have been Revenge or No Way Out, and he did something over here in the couch. And then the director was like, no, it needs to be over here. And then, you know, they didn't a couple more times. And at the end of the day, he goes, no, it, it's over here. What I need to do, what I need to get out of this, how I react. Yeah. And I think that at the end of the day is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so much more infatuated with character development as I get older, because I think it's less about the wow, but more of the, the how the face reacts. So that's, well, I, I, you know, I, I could really go on about that, but like, I, I really, um, I like to play in a lot of different sandboxes as an actor, but basically what I'm interested in is stories about human beings and people. And I don't think we have any shortage of stuff that's just entertainment or poppy. And I think that um, there's a, there's a real, and there are a lot of films that are doing this, but there, there is a real need for films to be about um what we all live through and what we go through because that's helps us be better human beings not just turn our brains off but actually reframe the way we look at the world and uh help us move through the world in a different way and that's what i really um believe in and then i i also part of me feels that not every director everybody should you know is in is in, is a servant of whatever they have inside of them but I do believe in as a whole that character driven independent cinema has this mandate as far as I'm concerned on it to it's what I'm trying to do is tell character driven stories that are that grab your attention and keep you in some way at the edge of your seat wanting to know what happens next. It doesn't mean that everything has to be super adrenalized but tell but it, it demands filmmakers to tell if you want to have a a, a a cinema about human beings that has cultural market share in this world where people's attention spans are so small and there's so many options it it's impendent it, it it's it's um uh, whatever it's incumbent upon filmmakers who want that to be part of our cultural filmic landscape to get better at telling stories that appeal to people and to not have what often is the case, which it feels like, well, I could go watch something that's about human beings, but I have to make sure I've really got a good night's sleep and I really am going to pay attention. I really sort of have to already be interested in that or I'm going to go see something about the world's going to end and I know I'm going to be at the edge of my seat and watch all this shit. I just really wish there were more options that were not boring, that were well-told stories and that didn't have to revert to, to a genre or sort of bring in some element that often feels like bullshit to me to get people to watch them. I think there's a way to do that in a, you know, in a different way that keeps people, you know, engaged and can, can, can kind of bring a little more juice and a little more life and a little more fire to, to stories about human beings. Yeah. I mean, cause at the end of the day, the worst thing is a Trojan horse that either doesn't live up to what you were trying to package. Sure. But Natalie, I think he's saying he doesn't want any more werewolf movies. <laughs> uh, that's the exemption. I have a werewolf. <laughs> but, but speaking of, you know, maybe to wrap this up and not keep you guys from, uh, you know, your the rest of your day, what are the things that excite you? You know, everybody has a, a you know, perceived like, 
you know, coolness factor or things that they, you know, they think people want to hear them say, but like, what are the things that you like and, and how does that inform your, your choices? Great. Natalie, you go first. Um, I, I'm like secretly just obsessed with documentaries. Like when I, when I, um, Ha have time where I'm just like, I'm just going to watch something for myself. I actually end up watching documentaries. I just love watching real people doing like living their lives and um, watching that. Um, it was just funny because I, I mostly make narrative films. I, I do make, make, make some docs, but, but mostly narrative, but um, yeah, I don't know. I find real, real life to be really, really fascinating. Uh I thought I was going to have an answer by the time you finished, but I don't. I mean, I really like um, I'm really excited by how many young arts or filmmakers there are now. You know, like if you look at in a lot of these different companies that are putting out movies and really that there's a generation that seems genuinely interested in that, um, that feels like counter programming to like a decade that was so dominated by just blockbusters. And so lots of really weird idiosyncratic personal movies. That's what I'm excited about as like a fan. But in my personal life, I find myself not watching a lot of movies because it's kind of like I've done it all day. And at night, you know, it's not what I want to do. So I end up reading a lot. I love The New Yorker. Um, I watch I watched over the last couple of years, I think the entirety of Shark Tank. Um, and I loved that. I loved watching that. Uh, it was really fun because I felt like I was learning about business and it's just like a perfect dramatic setup it's like i have a dream and here's these six people and i have to convince them of the dream and all this shit um and uh and then i'm i'm really excited i there's a, i have a theater space uh that's uh we're gonna open and and do our first play in in march um that is uh that's kind of at the heart of everything I've always been interested in, even though I haven't done a lot of professional theater. So I'm really been learning a lot about putting that building together and how to make it all work. It's this historic trolley station um, from 1906. That's like this big brick cathedral sort of called the Huron substation. And so we're going to have a uh, theater three or four times a year in there. And then series of evenings and writing workshops, acting workshops, et cetera, in between these performances. Um, so it's been very exciting and, uh, you know, required a lot of energy, but that's really thrilling. These we've started to, we had a, uh, a screening of shadow brother Sunday in there with like 200 people hanging off the banister. And it was, you know, it was just, uh, it was really thrilling to see this dream, like slowly just in its infancy, starting to come to fruition. Fantastic. I think that now that, uh, you know, pandemic's over, the strike is over. I mean, you may, may have made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs, but I think that your tra tra career trajectory is infinitely longer. And uh, thanks to support from family and your acting coach and Natalie's group, I think both of you are going to uh, just be the next generation of storytellers. So I'm thrilled to be speaking with you. would love to, you know, throw more praise your way, but um I think we could just say we'll catch you next time.